Good morning, all of you, and welcome on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, welcome to this lovely auditorium. And I'm delighted and honored to uh, introduce to you a wonderful speaker, a famous man who requires very little introduction. So I'm not going to do that thing of normally saying that and then going on to read his entire Wikipedia entry, which goes on to several pages. Um, before that, a brief talk about um, what this whole event is about. Uh, Narayan Dutt, my maternal uncle, was a famous journalist. And in addition to all that we know about him, what was odd was that he was born into a South Indian Telugu family and then became a noted Hindi journalist. And he had an early Sanskrit and a Vedic education, but was a staunch rationalist and an atheist. And he would have loved to be at this talk. He would have absolutely loved it. He was a journalist and he would have really uh, enjoyed to, uh, today's talk. I'm representing Devagitam Trust, uh, started in my grandfather's name, and uh, its current president, Mr. Mukunda, is out here in the, in the audience, and we're very grateful to him because on an annual basis, they run this uh, Narendat Memorial Lecture. And we do that in collaboration with Abhignana. If you don't see a logo there, it's because they are so modest, they don't even have a logo. But they do a wonderful job, um, and it's been led by Surya Prakash Pandit, who could not unfortunately be here because of his health, but there are several members here from Abhignana, so I welcome them all. And I think, just very briefly about, I was trying to see, well, what can we say about Mr. Sainath that isn't already known? And the truth is very little. And I was going just to say, it seems, yes, we all know he's an award-winning journalist, but as he himself describes, I think that he started off as a historian. And I think that comes through in each of his books. He's also the founder of Pari, the People's Archive of Rural India. And in every chapter of the book that you will, you will hear about, there is a QR code that will take you to Pari and to see the amazing work that has been done there. He's a teacher, he teaches journalism, and he's an author. And you'll see the two books that uh, I think we're going to talk about his latest book, The Last Heroes. But his earlier book was also a huge bestseller, Everyone Loves a Good Drought. And that's what made him, I think, extremely famous as an author. And finally, I'm going to say this slightly controversially to him, I think he is a modern freedom fighter. Um, because he's written about all the freedom fighters that we have had. And it begs the question, what is a freedom fighter now? If India has not had all the freedoms that we were promised, who's fighting for it? I think we will agree that Mr. Sainath is one of them. So welcome today and welcome to Mr. Sainath. Thank you so much. Delighted and honored to be here to do this lecture. And. Uh, Nice that people turn out on a Sunday morning. I wouldn't, but uh, for a talk, but here I am, and here you are. If you browse through the net when you get home this afternoon, evening, I suggest you look at, I suggest you look at a website of the government of India, official website. It's called Azadi Ka Amrut Mahatsav. So to celebrate, as the logo says, over there, ma the master says, to celebrate, ce celebrating 75 years of Indian independence. That's what it says. It's a very costly exercise. The Azadi Ka Amrut Mahatsav's first tranche, as the site tells you, was about 110 crores or something like that. This extremely elaborate, lengthy, inexhaust seemingly inexhaustible number of pages website does not have a single picture, a single photograph, a single portrait, a single video, a single story, a single article by or about a living freedom fighter. And there are still several of them. 
eight of the people in this book of mine are alive one of them from bengaluru died only last year um doreshami and uh, not a single photograph of any living freedom fighter what are you celebrating oh there are many photographs and you know whose photographs you know the same photographs that are on your covid vaccination certificate and on ration cards and i think fairly soon on every gas cylinder and bus ticket so those photographs are there there are articles on the triumph of india's drone technology what that has to do with celebrating 75 years is the other astonishing thing about the uh, website is the complete absence of a word a paragraph on what british colonialism was what colonialism did to india now if you're talking about a freedom struggle and independence what were you fighting against if british colonialism does not merit a mention a detailed mention in a website dedicated to your independence what the hell were you fighting for yeah the website by the way starts moving the struggles way beyond way beyond british colonialism okay heroes from the 17th century are introduced suggesting to you who the enemy was not british colonialism right so you have very genuine great warrior heroes like lachit borpukhan of assam what was his war against against the moguls okay now as i see the trend in the website it's moving backwards to the point where you will arrive at alauddin khilji and the slave dynasty just so that you know what your freedom struggle really was now lachit borpukhan died 150 years before british 100 years before british colonialism but you're moving this backwards it's no longer a retelling of history it's an inventing of history yeah retelling is not a bad thing from generation to generation as you gain more knowledge more data more sources but this is fabrication yeah and uh, the point about british colonialism that is i mean both the point about excluding freedom fighters from a website celebrating indian independence they have one thing somewhere you know about forgotten forgotten heroes or something like that unsung or forgotten and there are indeed some genuine people none of them alive there are some and there are a few that are actually best forgotten yeah and but none of thing thing about why did your people rise against colonialism something happened in british colonialism what happened incidentally if you notice in when you declare 75 years of celebration they declared a 3 year celebration like you normally you do at centenaries i love that i'm for that and in that period in that period uh you do not have on any indian newspaper or television channel a detailed series recalling what colonialism did you did not have one independent documentary film yeah on what happened under british rule you had those 
on august 15th those scenes from the uh, national film archives of satyagrahis and people being beaten with lathis which we have seen only a couple of hundred times yeah but no the government did not think it fit nor did your independent private media feel the need to broadcast anything about the freedom yeah somebody showed i think attenborough's film on gandhi that was it nothing what was your whole thing about what were you fighting for and who did the fighting so what happened under british rule incidentally significant amount of new research is underway on that and the latest is comes from an economic uh, um, an economic demographer and historian called jason hickel and his co-author dylan sullivan and it's painful that all of this comes this work published work is happening outside of india what have you seen in your own media what have you seen in your own schools and colleges around this yeah in the events to they on the website it claims one event every 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever 50 events in a day and the sum of that event is a bunch of school children in tirunal valley singing vande mataram okay so these are the events what do we what are we getting to you know in the debate over covid 19 which has been decisively re- uh, resolved in the conclusion that india did better than any other country in the world in handling covid yeah all the major institutions looking at covid deaths placed india's death figures at between 2 and 1/2 and 4 and 1/2 million johns hopkins university lancet wh everybody placed figures about 2 and 1/2 million but mr modi said that his government said 4 lakh 86000 and that's it not one person you know not a mosquito died beyond that number and of course all the others are involved in a great conspiracy against india it doesn't mean that you accept every, every for me everything that lancet says or john hopkins says is not you know it's not gospel and it's not to be but you engage with it you look at it why are people with no cause to be harming you you know involved in a conspiracy against you the human development index of the united nations ranks you at 132 the lowest you have ever been since the hdrs began in 1991 that also is a conspiracy chief economic advisor and you know various other designations write articles in the indian express op-ed page showing how it's completely fraudulent that your rank is 132 Hmm. uh in the index after index in the global hunger index you are now 107 out of 121 nations rwanda is managing its hunger better than you are okay you please question the figures and say you know even if you prove that you are doing better than one or two above you it still doesn't leave you in a very good place but that's a conspiracy hmm. then uh, you have uh, sorry then you have uh, index after index after index is a conspiracy the ultimate index is the environmental performance index of yale and columbia universities the law and the think center uh, environment centers where we have managed an incredible 180 out of 180 nations 
so but, but the rest but let's leave that the rest of the world is involved in conspiracies they're all jealous of us we're we're such wonderful people hey right. so can't help it if everybody is jealous of us what happened under british colonialism why did i bring up the covid numbers you all noticed that during the debate the debate was around how do people construct those numbers you're looking at the normal death rate and then you are looking at the excess above that normal death rate and it's what is called excess deaths okay that shows a lot of people the figure of 4 million or whatever we haven't got on to the excess deaths issue we just said it's 4 lakh 86000 and that's it yeah what were the excess deaths during british rule anyone like to take a guess 4 million 168 million and in uh, not less than 50 million in the 40 years between 1880 and 1920 and the lowest figure across british rule the most conservative estimate of the economic demographers now working on the subject is that 100 million in the vicinity of 100 million there were excess deaths by the way though of course you should remember that india at the time included what we today call pakistan bangladesh um you know parts of other countries as well uh but hickel and sullivan show you it's a paper which you can all follow up on it's freely available to you it's published in the world development review of november 22 so it's as recent as that it's a peer reviewed journal very well known journal world development and uh, they show you two things it the paper is called capitalism and extreme poverty a global analysis of real wages human height and mortality since the long 16th century now the they covering other countries as well so if they're involved in a conspiracy it's really a very large one it's not just india they're writing about hmm uh they say over 100 million excess deaths at least 50 million 1880 to 1920 somewhere in the vicinity of 100 million people died prematurely at the height of british colonialism that is understood to be the period between 1880 and 1930s so we are talking we do, it's from why do they start from 1880s because you have robust census data from that period that's why they calculate backwards also you can by assumptions on what was india's death rate its life expectancy prior to british rule we know something from british demographers themselves ws lilly digby a couple of including a couple of demographers who were englishmen who turned bitterly anti british because of what they were seeing what we know is that when the british landed here indian life expectancy was slightly higher than that of scotland and wales and about the same as that of england now if we take that assumption through the 16th 17th centuries then it's a nightmare okay but just let's take the 50 million in those 40 years tell me if 1% of 1% of that had happened in a european country you would be calling it genocide yeah genocide in bosnia check how many people died hmm? and we don't even know how many of those people who died in bosnia died from the bombing of different air forces and nations here you know who did the killing and then under british rule real wages declined as never before in indian history we have that calculation 
life expectancy life expectancy you have amitabh bachchan no less telling you about it getting the figures slightly all right but broadly okay life expectancy in 1880 to 1910 yeah as life expectancy was about the same as britain death rate was about the same as britain it falls by 1880 to in 1880 1910 to 26.7 years life expectancy in 1931 census indian life expectancy is 21 years and 9 months it starts reversing and shooting up after you gain independence 30 and, and the death rates you know uh, went from 37.2 to 44.2 per 1000 in 31 years economic historian robert c allen says that when the british came i mean we know that india was about contributed say about 18% of global gdp etc etc you all know that in the in the period from when they are able to count the rise in extreme poverty don't forget that the british have already been there 130 years but they're counting it from 23% to which 23% they have also contributed but we can't calculate it and uh, between between uh, that 1880 and 1940s they double extreme poverty in this country extreme poverty you can take as destitution extreme poverty is doubled from 23 to 50 plus percent in this country what happened under colonialism is extremely relevant to how you address and engage with the problems of today okay they doubled extreme poverty rate but the figure base figure of 23 they had already contributed to that in 130 years so that is what is happening with your um british rule 31 famines 31 famines 24 major famines and in the 1776 warren hastings writes a very proud letter you remember the great bengal famine 12 million deaths of i'm not talking about the 1940s talking about 1770s the famines begin within 10 years of the battle of plassey okay and by the way dwaraknath tagore's team of trusted uh, friends were collecting as late into the 1900s the songs of women paddy paddy harvesters and uh, Uh, not only paddy harvesters but women weaving at the charka till the 1940s these songs were sung in bengal okay here's just a few lines from one of them uh, this was collected by sirish chandra majumdar very close to um, and published by the way in a bengali journal in the 30s oh dear what a tragedy the nawab has lost his life in plassey the small telangas wearing their red coats bent their knees and at mir mahan that mir mahan was the one general who remained loyal to siraj ud daula and at mir mahan they shot oh dear what a tragedy the nawab has lost his life in plassey the arrows fly thick and fast bullets fly around how much can mir madan alone endure oh dear what a tragedy the nawab has lost his life in plassey the elephants cry in the stables the horses don't have water the nawab fell in kasbag sitting in kolkata mohan lal's last weeps oh dear what a tragedy the nawab lost his life in plassey it shows you 
whose where their sympathies lay it shows you very clearly they were it shows you very clearly that they were aware of the british as a very different kind of entity a very different kind of enemy hmm. from and this song which would have originated around the 1760s was sung into the 1930s in bengal 31 famines what i mean the kind and scale of famines the 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 skull famine the dhoja famine the great bengal famine and uh, the doji bhara famine the great bengal famine 10 million doja bhara famine 11 million 1876 great darbar famine 11 million uh, 8.5 million and the bengal 1942 famine 4.3 million in which at which time the last of the famines the british exported food grain and banned imports they not only exported food grain they banned imports you should see this wonderful book by professor uh, by dr madhushri mukherjee churchill secret war by the way what did churchill have to say at that time you know so even today i find high court judges and others and supreme court constitutional expert experts quoting churchill on democracy you know it's quoting it's it's quoting hitler on humanism i hate indians they are a beastly people with a beastly religion Hmm. By the way, how do you? How much do you think was looted from this country by British rule? Any guesses? Trillions. The Dada Bai Nauroji in 1905 wrote "Poverty and Un-British Rule," where he first formulated the theory of the drain. Right? The theory of the drain. He came to some nine uh, billion pounds. but he was only looking at tariffs and things and he was looking at a set area for which the data were available to him professor utsa patnaik more recently in the last 5 years has calculated across the spectrum and she says at a very conservative estimate 44.6 trillion dollars here we are promising ourselves 22 by 2025 will be a 5 trillion dollar economy though we shift that goal post every time it gets closer to 2030 you know 2030 now 44.6 imagine what happens to any nation yeah if in 5 years time you take out 10 trillion dollars there is a period in 1880s when this happens you take out that 5 trillion dollars 3 trillion dollars worth of wealth out of a country what happens to that country happened hmm. i mean there is we could go on for ever about the incredible damage that this caused us and uh, then there was also very difficult to calculate the looting of the forests from the adivasis how many people know that nelson's fleet at trafalgar the ships were made mostly of wood that came from palgar and thane in maharashtra okay you destroyed the you destroyed the forests of the adivasis incidentally speaking of who were your freedom fighters the adivasis were the first to die for freedom the last to benefit from it also no also know that the you know the way history has been written it's always written by victors and by dominant amongst the victors my favorite saying on history as a guy who was trained as a historian was uh an african one in swahili actually which says if lions were historians 
the tales of the jungle would not favor the hunter the people in the book i'm trying to cover for me they are the lions of the freedom struggle their tales do not favor the hunter they do not for them it's a scandal that the azadi ka amrut mahotsav does not talk, talk to you about british colonialism and what it did hmm. the in 8 in 1776 warren hastings writes to the east india company saying we notwithstanding the decimation of fully a third of the population you know that language of the time notwithstanding the decimation of nearly a third of the population purnia bengal hmm, we have still successfully raised the rents and that the rents were that the rents were raised uh, uh, that the rents were that we could do this was owing to the rents being violently violently he uses the word the rents being violently enforced at their earlier standards he's posting yeah that we did this fighting killing mayhem and raised the rents in 1840 the chairman of the east india company the ceo if you like tells the british parliament what does he say in parliament he says this company to applause has successfully converted india from a manufacturing country to a country that now exports raw produce maybe the make in india of the time because the raw produce was made here no yeah. make in india now here are the british boasting about their atrocities yeah and what do you do in your 75th year of independence you lower the flag to mourn the death of the symbol of british colonialism of 200 years you lower the flag what an insult to your freedom fighters and you conduct this stupid debilitating nonsensical debate in parliament about remarks made outside the country against humiliating anti national remarks about the country yeah and here you are humiliating and disgracing your entire freedom struggle and your freedom fighters at home the the uh, entire do you know something else about that flag which they your human those freedom fighters alive those i know were in tears how can they lower the flag for this person and these individuals with this this call uh, colonial power that we gave our lives to fight okay that's what their attitude was another thing a flag is not a piece of cloth where you paint the, your favorite colors a flag is a national flag is an expression of your history your aspirations your unity your diversity and one more thing the indian flag by law under the flag code was always made of khadi they changed the law they changed the code so that you could make it out of polyester so that you could fulfill the government's program which they did of har ghar ka tiranga do you know what that did it rendered hundreds and hundreds maybe a thousand khadi weavers across the country bankrupt they did not get a single order in chennai chennai four Uh, four hours away from chennai is a village that claims to have made the woven the first flag for india people from that village on august 9th last year marched to chennai in protest against the change in the flag code khadi weavers went bankrupt from uttar pradesh to bihar to two days in a year they make money two days two occasions sorry republic day and independence day 
They did not get a single order for a flag. And since it's made of polyester, you know who did. Um, so th this is how we treat. In that kind of situations with millions of people dying, people began to pr protest. People began to protest against the against the rule. The greatest single cause was the unbelievable deprivation, hunger, and indignity, humiliation, and all you can club under, enforced, imposed and enforced inequality. Okay? That was what led to this uprisings, to the, an uprising that was far greater than our present history books capture. An uprising that was uniting people across the spectrum, castes, religions, cultures, languages. The 15 people in this book spoke between them 10 different languages. Yeah. None of them uh, was an Oxbridge elite. Another of the myths of our history, Indians went abroad and they you know, learned about liberty and human rights from reading Rousseau and Locke and Hobbes and who the hell else. And you know, in other words, that your ideas of freedom and your independence you owe to the West. It wasn't the Oxbridge elites, elites, much less a bunch of Brahmin Baniyas from Oxbridge who liberated your country. Gandhi was extremely clear on this. You can find any number of, I, I have two sayings of Gandhi in the book. The introduction starts with a line of his, where he is re replying to a letter, an adulatory letter from Prema by Kantak while he is imprisoned in Yerav Yerwada jail in 1931. He very gently tells her, where everyone's praising him for his, what he's done. He says, great men appear to be the cause of revolutions in the world. In truth, the people themselves are the cause. In even 15 years before that, or 16, in 19, 1914, 17 years before that, Gandhi is returning from South Africa. A triumphant Gandhi stops in London Celebratory meeting for him is held by Sarojini Naidu and the British aristocratic elite and the Labour Party people. And everyone is engaging in fulsome uh, adulatory speeches. When his turn comes, Gandhi, who was plain Mr. M.K. Gandhi at the time, says, your felicitations are directed at the wrong address. The great, whatever success we had in South Africa was because of the struggle of the indentured laborers. I was merely their lawyer. I was merely their face. And to show you that it's not false modesty or false, you know, fake modesty, the Gandhi narrates several examples of people. The most, the thing that hurts him most is the memory of Hati Singh from Punjab, Gurdaspur. Indentured laborer, released at, from his indenture, goes back to Punjab at age 75. When the struggle of indentured laborers begins, Hati Singh goes back. I mean, what is it to be age 75 in 1913-14? He goes back across the seas to participate in the struggle and ends up sharing a jail cell with Gandhi. Gandhi is not amused. He scolds Hati Singh and recalls in tears the conversation. You know, Gandhi says, you've been released. You're a free man. Go back to your family. And Hati Singh, how could you come back? And Hati Singh says, Gandhi, how could I not come back when my people are in revolt and rebellion, when my people are in struggle? I find that one of the most moving anecdotes of the Mahatma. Many more, he gives you many more. He's, he seriously believes what he is saying. Remember, 
he then comes to india and converts the congress from a jimkana tea party into a political party and a mass movement the next year in champaran he is talking about only the peasantry can give you the energy in the battle against the british champaran it's there that he makes a transition to a very different person but it's been coming for some years now look at these different people in this book i have looked at not oxbridge elites but uh, and and by the way our own history books i went to college in madras university at a time when the university department told us still you should read vincent smith the greatest nastiest ra most racist of all imperial historians you know uh yeah and you know that stuff which you learned the sun never sets on the british empire my family was involved in the freedom struggle my granddad was expelled from ireland very lucky not to face a firing squad because he went there and joined the sinn fein and the republican struggle and in the easter uprising everybody was executed a few of them not because of his own merits but because he was a colleague and comrade of Eamon de Valera who was holding an american passport and de valera when and the british needed the americans to join world war 1 so they couldn't execute de valera and de valera said all those who were busted along with me have to also be pardoned or released so he was kicked out came to india the irish take on everybody you know the sun never sets on the british empire was a different one the irish said the sun never sets on the british empire because even god can't trust those bastards in the dark <laughs> so that i mean i think that was a very well put uh, take on the struggle and do you know that the history of the british army in india is riddled with revolts where indian soldiers join irish and scot soldiers in rebellions the most last of the famous irish rebellions was the one in solan in himachal pradesh the connaught rangers because of the repression in ireland they revolted yeah so the you have a history of this again look at but look at the look at the kisan andolan hmm. anti national khalistani all these things that were said about it i was many days in the kisan andolan at the gates of delhi many visits and i spoke from their platform very often not too often but often enough and i'll never forget winter morning january 21 i'm on the stage and there's a lot of metal like someone is sitting in the audience and playing with a mirror like people do at cricket matches for instance Pl playing putting the mirror in the eyes of the and i'm looking and then i realize staring me in the face are 200 medals ex soldiers all of them farmers sitting in that audience ranging from lance nayak to brigadier okay brigadier each of them with half a dozen medals people who fought 62 china people who fought 65 pakistan people who sacrificed liberation of bangladesh 71 people who fought in sri lanka 84 yeah the people you call khalistanis anti nationals these are the things you call them the point i'm trying to make is the rebellion the so called sepoy mutiny in 1857 was never a sepoy mutiny first of all the word is sipahi not sepoy and the british were as murderous with their pronunciation pronunciation as with people <coughs> the sepoy the indian jawan then and today is a kisan in uniform 
he has to reflect the mood of the villages if you were a soldier in 1857 meerat kanpur the rising of meerat and kanpur was not by the people of meerat and kanpur it was by soldiers who were villagers and farmers who were stationed in the cantonments of meerat and lucknow and kanpur all your major rebellions all your major uprisings came from rural india rural people from farmers and laborers while the rest of your elites were ne- seeking negotiations to find accommodation in the hierarchies of the british ruling classes the raja rani log okay that sort of this is the fundamental truth your freedom struggle came from ordinary people that's why this book looks at 15 people who were farmers laborers cooks yeah cooks couriers carpenters malis they also fought and they are the people of whom gandhi said the people themselves are the cause not one of them the people in this book went on to gain high office and they didn't try to they had they stood up for their country when it was needed and they went back the astonishing thing is after independence they continued to fight they still do in your neighboring state you just lost one man last year who continued to fight dore sami what sort of a character was dore sami he started a newspaper reluctant journalist only because a friend of his who was dying of rabies said you must take over my newspaper so a man who had never done journalism took over a newspaper and became a fine journalist became one of the presidents of the karnataka working journalists my so working journalist federation and look at the guy look at your journalist today look at your editors today rather he starts a newspaper and registers it outside mysore across the border in anantapur and registers it under six titles okay so that the moment they shut down one newspaper the same newspaper appears under another title without break the next day so he, he registers it under six titles at this man at 101 102 you go to his home as several journalists did when the rss mla former minister attacks him saying dore swami is a fake freedom fighter he never took part so you journalist shoy ka pet is house ask him he is busy writing sir what are you doing he says i say i i'm i'm writing my cv you know <laughs> at age 101 100 i'm writing my cv i say the other thing all these guys had was a sense of humor and dore swami certainly did i mean just think of the mischief of it that i launch a newspaper with six titles five in reserve you shut it down the next one starts and the maharaja of mysore did shut down his newspaper and it comes the next day in another name that sort of character by the way he was the only or one of these 15 who completed college and was arrested immediately after in a conspiracy case whatever he was a sworn socialist and joined hands with the communists in the strike in the worker strike in bengaluru mill worker strike then comes Sh- n s shankaraya the next most highly educated a college university to be topper 15 days before his final exam shankaraya 15 days is arrested in american college madurai founder of the tamil poetry society which still exists the top debater orator of the campus 15 days before final exam arrested in 1941 sent to jail released 12 hours before independence day on august 14 steps out of jail doesn't contact his family nothing marches to the madurai corporation ground to celebrate independence at midnight where the crowds are already gathered in lakhs he and all his fellow 
look now tell me the kind of mischief that dore swami played do you see any possibility of any of your newspaper owners doing such a thing today hmm? or shankaraya 19 thrown into jail they go on hunger strike for their fellow prisoners to get the same rations as they do okay they say that you can't have this a b c class prisoner treatment everybody has got to get the same meal you know even now there are divisions in the jails you know? and by the way the the business of cleaning the toilets by the jail manual is restricted to particular caste please know this it is restricted to particular caste you humiliate your dalits and you know loka lower caste even there and there it's done by manual you had an excellent piece on this from a lady in the vidhi legal cell a few days ago in the indian express op-ed page then shankaraya and all of them go on a hunger strike it's a 19 day hunger strike on the 10th day of the hunger strike the inspector general makes a surprise visit to the prison and finds this teenager reading literature and takes the book from his hands and says your 10 days without a, a morsel of food and you're sitting here and reading maxim gorky's mother the mother by maxim gorky yeah the the nature of this character defies me you and shankaraya at 102 is still making speeches okay online now 2019 he no uh, 18 at 9 at 98 he inaugurates the tamil nadu progressive writers association travels to madurai to inaugurate it and delivers a speech standing like at the podium his contemporary r nallakkan younger than he is the infant of the group right now 98 nallakkan at 95 we ask him uh, comrade rnk which is how he is known are you also still traveling a lot he says no comrade now i am old i travel out i travel outside for lectures only once a week <laughs> at 95 <laughs> man if i could have that condition and energy at 65 that would be a miracle you have mallu swarajyam i want you to see who this person is at age born in a landlord family forswears her origins she and her brother join the telangana uprising and distribute 200 acres of their land to the tenants and serfs that they had and she is killing razakars with a slingshot at age 11 to 13 at 13 she is a professional marksman killing razakars in the uprising they fight the razakars they fight the british everything at age 16 you saw her photograph with the rifle she becomes the leader of all the dalams of all the dalams not female dalams male and female dalams she becomes the leader they all have to report to her at age 16 in the bayaram region of varangal which was the epicenter of the revolt varangal was one of the great epicenters of that uprising in 2014 at age 84 i put her on a stand before 1500 techies in hyderabad and we are interviewing her oh another thing about several of these people some are extremely sweet or some of them are extremely cantankerous and short tempered and are still fighting you know so i have tasted the anger of maluswarajyam for asking stupid questions what were to her stupid questions but which i had to ask for the sake of the audience i say 
Swarajam Garu, you know, it is uh, fine. I also have seen people killing with slingshots. I've seen irulas, bondas using the slingshot to do hunting. But is it an effective combat weapon? She got mad. Uh, she, get, she had a phenomenal line. When asked by the techies, you know, in those days you could fight, you said you fought for justice with a rifle, with a slingshot. What can we do? A lady who never spoke a word of English lectured them for the next five minutes on Occupy Wall Street. And she said it was full of techies like you. And then she said this beautiful line I'll never forget. She said, the slingshot was my weapon. The laptop and the mobile phone are yours. Use them to fight for justice. It was such a moving and brilliant line. The slingshot was my weapon. The laptop and mobile phone are yours. The techies aged between 21 and 25, 26 gave her three standing ovations that day. You know? I mean, see the impact of putting a genuine bona fide freedom fighter before your generation. This is a generation that has been robbed of its history. And I regret to say, mine is the generation that has done the robbing. Okay? I want every young person here, and I see several of you, know one thing about you. When you go back, some of you, in, still in your teens, not only have grandparents, you haven't have great-grandparents alive. Go back and talk to them. You will find every family has a story of the freedom struggle. That's how widespread and great an uprising it was. Every family has a story. There are a tiny percentage, statistically negligible but powerful politically, whose stories are very bad and won't want to tell you their stories because they were the collaborators. Okay? And each of the freedom fighters in the books tells you two things. The difference between independence and freedom. The book begins with a line from Captain Bao, another guy with a terrible temper. He was the underground leader of the Tufan Sena in Maharashtra. Prati Sarkar was an underground government that declared independence from British rule in 1943 and held the principality of Satara, 600 villages, without allowing the British to function. The British in 43 were in very bad shape. All over the world, there were revolts because Britain was back to the wall in Europe. There was an imminent Nazi invasion of England. So all the soldiers, everybody went there, including millions of tons of grain from, the, from Bengal, heightening your famine of Bengal 1942 to 44. And so the book begins with this line from Captain Bao. We fought for independence and freedom. We achieved independence. I think in that one line he has said everything. All of them make this distinction. For them, freedom is a much larger, longer term project than independence. According to me, the Indian constitution is the finest essence and distillation of the idealism of the freedom struggle. Not just the preamble, which is lovely, but also the directive principles of state policy which, by the way, was inspired by the Irish Revolution and the Irish Constitution of 1921. As far as I know, these are the only two constitutions that have a chapter not on the do's and don'ts, but not what shouldn't be, but what should be, a vision of your society. Yeah? And it is so good that the spirit of resistance continues. It showed in that Kisan Andolan. The farmers were fighting for all of you because the three farm laws, no newspaper, no news magazine, no bloody portal carried the full text of the laws for you to see. They were anti every human 
and every new every in citizen of this country they suspend the right to legal remedy article 32 of your constitution you cannot access because the law specifically forbids it and rules out the jurisdiction of all civil courts all civil courts when they were fighting there the farmers were fighting by the way the farmers were fighting long before us they understood what dependence on adani would do to you they were fighting adani did any one of your newspapers or your channels tell you that did any one of them tell you that your that mr ambani's personal wealth in 2021 forbes was greater than the gdp of punjab okay uh of course we say gsdp gross state domestic product mr adani's last year 22 was greater than the gsdp of haryana which is greater than that of punjab two individuals whose personal wealth was and in one case still is greater than the gdp of major indian agricultural states the farmers understood what was going we still don't apparently hmm. this whole idea of in that inequality was what the farmers were fighting today your inequality levels are at the rate are at the same stage as they were in 1921 in terms of economic inequalities in terms of in please understand that in 1991 india did not have a single dollar billionaire in 2021 we had 160 the maximum number of billionaires we added 42 in a single year greater than the preceding decade or preceding 8 years was in the first 12 months of the pandemic imagine that meaning this is disaster casino capitalism disaster capitalism hmm. so the and who made the money big pharma healthcare i hate that word there's no element of care in it it should be called health cash hmm. do you know that today of your 160 billionaires the largest single number are from health cash the next and another very big gainer was tech especially online tech byju's value doubled and trebled okay that level of inequality is back this is what your freedom fighters fought against then another thing about the people in the book the spectrum across all castes and social groups how many and how many freedom fighter books do you see and i'm very i'm, I'm proud of this because there would have been even more had they not died please know that there are lots of women freedom fighters in this book not because i said there should be though yes i edit have that in mind but because they simply were there women fought in millions for your freedom and they did much more dangerous things than most of us will ever know about there's a woman in this book today the oldest person in the in the alive babani mahato who spent a morning telling me why are you wasting your time i'm not a freedom fighter my husband was a freedom fighter my husband was a freedom fighter by the nath you are 20 years too late to interview him he died i said why was he a freedom fighter and not you she says i ah, he went to jail no 13 months i never went to jail we have defined freedom fighters in our laws swatantrata sainik samman yojana of 1980 and the earlier freedom fighter pension law of 1972 in such a way to exclude millions of people especially women dalits and adivasis the same as we do in every damn law we have yeah exclude them whether in the numbers of farmers suicides because of the way we define who is a farmer because of the way we define who is a freedom fighter your laws say you know and when dore swami was confronted with it he was one of those educated people who was able to respond he your laws demand that you have to have been in jail for so many months 
but all your underground revolutionaries netaji bos etc the ina they did not go to jail does that mean they were not revolutionaries as the one woman ina fighter alive from odisha lakshmi panda who died after i interviewed her she asked me this devastating question because i never killed anyone i'm not a freedom fighter because i never fired a, i learned how to use a rifle but never fired a bullet in anger to kill into a human body does that mean i'm not a freedom fighter because i worked in the kitchens of the ina while the british were bombing our forest camps hmm and i could not bring down those planes was i not a freedom fighter it just blew me away all she wanted was recognition shankaraya says in his we did you know the left refused to take pensions when it came in 72 shankaraya tells me even in the interview we fought for freedom not for pensions but i wish i wish they had got the pensions when i'm looking at the old telangana fighters the sh- shape they're in i wish at least medical assistance would be you know given to them they're in terrible shape and we but lakshmi panda wanted recognition that she fought for her country that's all she wanted you have salihan an adivasi woman remember first to die for freedom but she led a battle the only known battle when the rest of the country was having a uh, salt satyagraha in the landlocked areas the adivasis had forest satyagraha in what is today kalahandi koraput all these places there was a forest satyagraha her village saliha salihan led a battle which it's mind boggling i've been to the village many times been to the dense forest of that area her father was shot in in the thigh and fell in the while all the girls unmarried girls of course of the village were in the fields working they are a hunter gatherer tribe the sabars okay so when she got the news from the fields that your father is lying bleeding on this thing armed british security personnel were taking over the village burning the grain and uh, she can went rushing back all 40 young girls went imagine that most not a single girl would have been about 16 they were unmarried they were still in their father's village right so when she went back and saw her father and saw the british officer and head of the squad of the platoon standing over him with a gun she raced up to him and beat the hell out of him with a lathi she then chased that guy around the village finally the i mean immediately the other 40 girls joined in and attacked the platoon a bunch of 13 to 16 year old girls for what a what a moment in history 13 to 16 year old girls fought people armed with rifles and pistols with lathis and drove them out of the village there is a memorialization of the saliha uprising and by the way on the memorial her name does not appear every villager will tell you her story but on the names of that thing are the names of all the ruling castes the sahus the traders the brahmans whereas many of those people could never have been in that village in 1930 it was a dense forest village of sabar tribals there might have been one or two dalit castes over there nobody else okay so when i meet salihan in the in 90 in 98 i mean sorry in 2002 just after the gujarat riots she is starving she but she and baji mohammed another guy character no anger in them at all she flares up when you talk to her of her father's shooting this were the sort of people who fought yeah and she brought out proudly a certificate given to her by the local administration hmm mana patra certificate of honor what does it say it praises her for being the daughter of kartik sabar <laughs> yeah and it mentions her achievement she has born three sons 
I mean, you know, after, that is the one report I could not write. For days, four of us journalists, very noisy, raucous, all male. We normally, when we leave a place, these are my Odia friends, journalists. We're always arguing in the, in the car after that. What did we see? What did we learn? Imagine that the four of us sat 130 kilometers each in his private tears, unable to come to grips with what we saw. And I wasn't able to write a story for a very long time. I only could write a poem, which is the first annexure of the book, a poem for Salihan. Yeah. These were your heroes. Then comes the other myth. Dalits did not take part in. It is absolutely untrue. The Dalits were the foot soldiers of, you know, they say, ah, look, they're celebrating Bhima Koregaon, where, first of all, where they defeated the Marathas. Yeah, sure. And by the way, have you noticed that it wasn't just the Mahar regiment, that the East India Company, by the way, at that time, not the Raj. Have you noticed how many other caste-based regiments the British started? Whether Gorkhas or Rajputs, so don't try dismissing them and pushing. It infuriates me when people draw up lists of freedom fighters and do not include the name of Baba Saheb Ambedkar, the man who crafted your constitution, which remains the finest embodiment of the idealism of your freedom struggle. If that wasn't a contribution to the, a man who launched the greatest struggle on the face of earth for human dignity, a struggle that still continues in our time, you want to exclude him. This is the nature of our society's attitude towards our freedoms and our freedom struggle. Shobha Ram Geherwar is a living, again, he and Nallakanda are the infants, 97 turned 98 in Ajmer. Shobha Ram Geherwar was a, is a Dalit, a Swan Gandhian, and an Ambedkar follower, uh, admirer and he told me I followed I was in so many streams Gandhivad or Krantivad this self-declared Gandhian from age 11 to 16 was making bombs <laughs> and transporting them by train to give them in Allahabad elsewhere etc Ajmer was a hot spot for this activity he met Chandrasekhar Azad at age 5 when I asked him how is it? He, went, he asked me, Aap te paas jeep hai kya? I said, yes. Today is April 14th, which I knew, B Ambedkar Jayanti. I want to garland the Ambedkar Murti. So I, he, we took him there, he garlanded the Ambedkar. I asked him, Gherwar Sahib, you, a self-declared Gandhian, a Dalit, who lives in the very same Basti, where he was born 97 years ago, made no money, two-time municipal councillor. I asked him, how does someone like you, I asked him quaking, as I told you, they can be very cantankerous. I asked him quaking, how does someone like you choose between Gandhi and Ambedkar? He blew up. Why should I choose? You choose. I don't have to choose. What principles of Gandhi I admire, I follow those. What principles of Baba Sahib I admire, I follow those. Who is anyone to tell me to choose? Yeah. It was such a crushing of the stupid, inane, vapid debates that we hold today. And the other thing we asked him was, when you looted the British train, that's where he says, we looted nothing. What the British looted from the Indian people, we brought that back. That was that's the spirit of that, of that kind of person. Hmm. And he's the guy who said, we fought for independence and uh, for freedom and independence, we achieved independence. Uh, I think it was the struggle that kept them that way. It was their struggle that kept them that way. Malu Swarajam at 92, Ask her what's wrong with society. She seems, she says, it seems to be affected by the same sort of paralysis that my body is affected by. <laughs> so, you, uh, thank you.
moves on. Sorry. Um, so uh, I think for me a very important question was, uh, you mentioned your generation robbed our, uh, our generation, let's say, I'm a millennial, uh, uh, of our history. Uh, where do you think that started happening? And uh, is there a way to re um, reverse it? And especially in a context where there is a rising uh, set of uh, right conservative intellectuals who are coming in <coughs> and uh, talking about Savarkar, uh, you know, justifying God, God say and, you know, uh, making them heroes. Uh, how, where do we correct this? You know, what is, yeah. what is the way forward? Thank you. Uh, see, that struggle of retelling of history, that's an ongoing one and it happens in most societies. Uh, in the 60s, as I said, when I went to college and this thing, there were still historians of imperialist historiography whose books were being recommended. In the 60s and 70s, there is a very fabulous, uh, I say fabulous and I'm, I'm prejudiced because they were my teachers. Uh, the historians like Romila Tapar, S. Gopal, Bipin Chandra, S. Bhattacharya, um, K. N. Panikkar, who was my guide in PhD. They really destroyed, demolished British historiography. You know, they were the generation that did that. Others came along who thought they would take it further, subaltern studies or whatever. But it basically did two things. It brought about a look at Indian history from an Indian perspective, not ruled or governed by British historiography. The second thing it did was to look at the role of masses in history. You know, many little uprisings that I learned of, which really surprised me. You know, why did the Rajas of Sambalpur revolt against the British? A lot of this I learned from learning a history based on a socio-economic approach to history. Later, a socio-economic cultural approach to history. So that then, when the Janta Party comes to power, the RSS within the Janta Party has these books withdrawn from the NCRT, the books of... Now, again, those books are, which were restored have been withdrawn they're sometimes even publicly burned. Hmm? Book burning is, you know, you know what mentality it speaks of. Yeah. So, uh, this was the uh, thing about the ongoing struggle in the telling of history. As I said, what you're seeing now is inventing. Now, like you brought up the issue of Savarkar. And I must say the only amusing thing in this whole debate is what came from Karnataka about Savarkar approaching the land, land the Indian landmass every day on the wings of a bulbul. You know? I think those bulbuls were very anti-national. Why did they take him back? You know? Actually, I think it was a lot of bull. Hmm. Uh, the, let me give you my understanding of Savarkar, whose book 1857 I read as a student and admired and I still think it's a good book worth reading because he hasn't come into his communal avatar as yet. <coughs> there is no whipping up of hatred against Muslims, etc. You know, in, in his, the early writings. In my assessment, Mr. Savarkar was a bona fide, genuine revolutionary till 1911. I mean, there he is escaping the police in Marseille, in, in, Marseille, in France, etc., coordinating with Indian revolutionaries. But he's put into jail and he goes to the other extreme. Yeah. Now, many, many people suffered in Andaman jails. Not just, uh, yeah, I knew some of those. 
he was the only one who wrote seven petitions begging for mercy not one of the 15 people in this book for them the idea of apologizing to the british they would rather have died than do it hmm i asked shankaraya wasn't it upsetting you were on your way to be a university topper certainly american college madurai topper wasn't it upsetting to be thrown into jail then he said he looked at me and said you don't understand it was an honor he said those it was an honor to be able to do this for your country hmm? and savarkar writes five of these petitions are in your national archives you can find the published versions of those in the works of ag norani on the rss and uh, in this it's not it's not the kind of mercy or early release petition of other freedom fighters all over the country there were some who wrote letters saying you know mother dying father crying i need to be home and you know what those guys did on being released gurmeet singh lakon founder of the desh bhagat yadgar memorial hall and committee in jalandhar for me it's a pilgrimage to see the freedom fighters of india who were in that hall people who left earning jobs in other countries to come back they were nris of a different kidney hmm. they came gandhi was an nri okay of a different kidney so they came back and fought and died gurmeet singh lakon released from andamans is back two weeks later he goes to punjab and there are bomb blasts at british barracks in the railway stations he jumps out of a train in fully manacled jumps out of a train and escapes okay he didn't ever go on his knees and not only beg for pardon but begs as these petitions do if released i will bring millions of misguided youth to the path of british civilization now you tell me that's a freedom fighter i have a problem <coughs> in 19 <coughs> the crown finally hears um and that debate is taking place in the in karnataka alongside the debate on tipu sultan and here is the rewriting of rewriting in 1992 there was a television serial the sword of tipu sultan the bjp newly born bjp party 6 7 8 years old appointed a one man committee founding vice president of the bjp and as rss a man as you can ever get k r malkani the only man to have been editor of both organizer and panchjanya for 35 years he was editor of organizer i knew him very amiable old gentleman whatever his politics he wrote a book he discussed with all of us that i'm studying tipu sultan he was he fancied himself an amateur historian that book is available to you online india first you can buy it off amazon the essay on tipu sultan concludes this was the first indian prince the only indian prince to die on the battlefield fighting the british without relent or without fear the death of tipu sultan set the independence of india back by one and a half centuries by a, which is more or less correct you can if you look at the timing and he actually shows you what a hero tipu sultan was this is in me writing it it's the founding vice president of the bharatiya janata party and one of the most respected members of the rss so today you are savarkar the rewriting a book is published in 1926 the life of barrister savarkar author is chitra gupta it's a very common it's a very common uh, pseudonym used in the 18th 19th centuries in india chitra gupta was the scribe of lord yama lord of death and i suppose the title of the author struck fear in you that you better pay attention 
or else. So Chitragupta was very commonly used and there were debates over who Chitragupta was. The book is a hagiography. In fact, the book gives hagiography a bad name. <laughs> and then in 42, again it's published. In 86, again it's published. And the debate becomes fierce on who is Chitragupta. Some very learned people float the theory that Chitragupta was C. Rajagopalachari, Rajaji. Now, by the way, I have, I have, I am, I have extremely strong differences with the politics of Rajaji, with the outlook of Rajaji, with what he stood for in economics. Yeah. But you know one thing, the man could write. <laughs> I grew up on that Mahabharat Ramayana translations of Sri Rajagopalachari. He could never write crap like that. Yeah. Then in the 86th edition, Savarkar's younger brother reveals to the publisher, who says it with a flourish, Chitragupta was none other than Savarkar himself. I then had to conclude that Mr. Savarkar had a very high opinion of Mr. Savarkar. <laughs> so that's what I think, yeah. The right wing in India has a sort of very uh, direct and simple message that can be captured in a few lines. Whereas a liberal outlook recognized that history is complex, diverse, requires effort, attention, engagement. And in the debates, you see a refusal to make this effort. So. How does one counter that in this sort of attention economy? What kind of message can one use? Well, when you read the book, tell me if you feel that it's something of an effort. Yeah, I, I think I totally agree with you. And the right has captured history, the space of culture, language, and history. In the Hindi belt, they've captured language as well, uh, and language and culture. and. History, they are enforcing their invented history. As I said, I mean, imagine when we are doing these textbook issues in Karnataka. How can you, you're blacking out your own historian K.R. Malkani. Hmm. I'm saying somebody, we ought to be replying to this. People ought to be, for that, people have got to engage with their own histories. That's why I'm asking people in the audience, young people, Go back and talk to your grandparents. You'll find, they, you know, you'll find that your nana, nani may have been in jail for weeks after a satyagraha or a dharna, or that your great grandmother went on the Dandi march. You will find all sorts of things. The histories, the many histories of India, are yet to be told. Hmm. The histories of ordinary people, the lions' history. Making the lions historians, not the hunters. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with you. And for that, I mean, I want, for instance, now Everybody Loves a Good Drought, my earlier book, is in its 60th edition. Hmm. The reason for that is entirely I owe it to young people. Whatever studies we've been able to do with when Mr. Shanbagh of Strand was alive and a few other friends, we know that the biggest buyer of that book and of this book is in the age group 17 to 25. But what made that book successful ultimately was young people who went on to become teachers, professors, made it a textbook. It's, an, it's a textbook in a between 125 to 150 universities and colleges. I want this to be an alternative textbook. If we can do that, please present copies of the book to your younger generation. To those who have young kids, I keep requesting this. Read the stories along with your children. Okay? Read the story with your children. It's, I'm getting incredible feedback when that happens. When someone reads along with her 13-year-old daughter or 12-year-old son, I'm getting phenomenal feedback. It means reaching that group, reaching that. So I think that's what I'm trying to do, and I hope it becomes a wider thing.
something. And I'm sure there are others trying to do it too. Um, you spoke of uh, inequality leading to the freedom struggle and it largely coming from the villages and the poor. Today, when we are facing similar proportions of inequality and uh, technology enabling a large chunk of uh, this country to live in oblivion, uh, and uh, what is your message to the elites of us sitting here, uh, many of us who uh, may not admit but are still oblivious to uh, that this, this inequality, uh, what, what can we do and what can each of us here do to address that inequality? Is there something from the uh, freedom struggle where the elites did take part in, in some way? Uh, is there some parallels that we yeah. can draw? Yeah, actually, by the way, uh, I would suggest that you look again at how the issue of justice and equality is worded in the Indian constitution. It's very thoughtfully, very beautifully worded. What does it say? Justice, social, economic, and political. It's a very, it's not by accident that it starts with social. Hmm? Because after independence, especially in the last few decades, we've gone on to completely marginalize the issue, divisive issue of caste. Yeah? Again, the dominant groups within the freedom struggle have had their take on it. We have invisibilized the role of the Dalit and Adivasi and we have, invis we have betrayed that promise. If you believe in your constitution, look at social inequality first. Look at it. And the other point is, of course, that in rural India and most anywhere else, social, economic, and ine you know, e economic inequality are very closely intertied. If you're looking at agricultural laborers, Dalits and Adivasis, you're looking at in the cities, Manuals, scavengers, sanitation, Dalits, and other very low castes. So I think we have to understand that there was, when you said my generation, there has been a great betrayal. We moved away from what the freedom fighters managed to rise above. We have sunk back into our comfortable caste and communal social silos. Yeah. And we are making enemies of people. The one, of, one of the most fantastic characters for me in the book, Mohammed Baji. I give you a description of how he was beaten up, his skull broken, and it wasn't in the freedom struggle. It was on sitting as a Gandhian before the Babri Masjid. He was sitting with 200 other Gandhians but he wore the skull cap and I mean the cap of very obviously signaling that he's a Muslim. I will never get over the fact that he had nothing, not a word of abuse for those who fractured his skull and placed him in hospital for a month. No anger. No recrimination. Actually speaking, which I cannot rise to, only love. I would feel I've achieved something incredible if I could emulate that, that attitude in that person. Now those divisions which they rose above, we have sunk back into them and create the present situation is where our rulers open up, you know, dig each festering, each wound in Indian society, even those that had seen a degree of healing. You, you claw them open you know, and make one social group, two social groups in Karnataka, Muslims and Christians. Make them incredible enemies and then set them against Dalits and Adivasis as well, which is another tactic across the country. The only way you're going to do that is for us to have approached the issue through the prism of justice. justice. Yeah. You can see elsewhere movements in the US in black movements for reparations. We have to accept our responsibility towards what has happened to the promises which were made 
the constitution was a social contract a social compact for all those who fought but did not benefit so we need to we need to have that we need to go back to social reform movements and above all we need to break the levels of inequality today and i think the way forward for that is there in your directive principles it's there yeah uh, uh, i have some benefit of age uh, behind me uh, so you know uh, we grew up reading a version of history which now is called leftist history right the last 25 years we are looking at something called rightist history then there is a revisit significantly of the role of the british and now increasingly we are also hearing this including your book the story of the common people um so um you know it seems that the history is now very fragmented it is, there is multiple version of history based on people's uh, agenda or view so how do you suggest uh, the young today or, or everybody today should uh, read history should we black out some of them and say we'll read this version or read everything and then use our own critical thinking to judge what is very, right what is wrong very obviously the latter you see the thing is there you're saying history is fragmented i would say history is very complex and we are being allowed to see it in fragments okay the point is this there is a difference between retelling and inventing we are in the present phase inventing things for which there is absolutely no evidence history has something called evidence and history has something called corroborative evidence more than one source of evidence you apply the simple rules of history to see like for instance the origin of the savarkar book you can you are perfectly at liberty to verify if you want to verify but if a section does not want to verify and says no i believe it and it's true then you are in a different phase of society that you know if you want to believe that you know you want to believe that the sun rises in the west and sets in the east you will believe it there are people willing to believe all kinds of things and the fact is actually that the the histo- what you call the leftist historians there were also non leftist historians who recognize the role of the left because most of the most of the people in my book i'm trying to say don't pigeon hole your freedom fighters they were open to many influences shobaram geherwar hmm? self declared gandhian hero worships ambedkar was a revolutionary underground member who made and transported bombs he was influenced by many forces except he says wo log ek inko ukli nahi kataya those fellows they, that was the one force significant by its absence in the freedom struggle before the last few years they never even claimed to be part of the freedom struggle hmm. today the force that brings laws saying you'll be punished if you don't stand for the national anthem where the force which for 70 years condemned the national anthem as rabindranath tagore's eulogy for the emperor of britain for the king of britain that's what they called it these are the people in 19 please read 1947 48 and 50 organizer on the constitution of india hmm? which they are sworn to uphold they are saying in in that in the organizer this is a ridiculous document they abuse the constitution draft that ambedkar has given and say the words are there is nothing bharatiya about this constitution it's a mishmash of borrowed ideas you know the whole point about the indian constitution and its workers was that they were open minded and willing to borrow ideas and never made a secret of it so the same people who condemn the constitution call it rubbish are today accusing others of being anti national violating the constitution 
the flag, which they said is an absolutely, by the way, Malkani wrote a piece for me when I was in deputy chief editor of Blitz, condemning the flag and the anthem. That was also Malkani. Okay? So it's a, it's a question of verification. You're using your brains. Thank you. Yeah, am I audible? Uh, yeah, so picking up, uh, backing of the question that he asked actually, I'm sorry if this comes out as amateurish, but we're in an era of history wherein on one hand we have authorities who are trying to get rid of certain parts of history, wherein textbooks are being read of certain emperors from a certain era because they're enemies. And on the other hand, we have people like you who are trying to bring in these hidden parts of history. So. I'm a film fanatic and I have this list of hidden figures from history and I'm the kind of person who would actually like to know about these kind of people. But then we also have these people who are not only reading us of this history of ours, but they're also trying to, as you said, invent new kind of history. So they're not only spewing ignorance, they're spewing, for a lack of better word, false narratives. So how do you think is going to, this is going to affect say future generations because even me at 20, uh, 21 years old I'm learning a lot of these new newer not very known things so in the future generations all of this is only going to get much more complicated with authorities telling us that this never even happened first of all I want to say that I think the questions you posed are not un whatever I think they are very important I think they're very good questions they're very important and you've gone to the heart and soul of the debate that we live in now. Okay. Uh, the, by the way, let me first address your film fanaticism. Shobha Ram Geherwar, when he was on the run, and I think you would like to know this, when he was on the run, and the leaders had to send away these bomb carriers, etc., to other parts of the country, he came to uh, Mumbai, to Bombay at that time. Do you know who hid him? He's very proud of it. Prithiviraj Kapoor. <laughs> and uh, he's very proud of it. Though actually, it's also ignorant of the rest of the film world. I asked him, did he keep you in? He said, no. He sent us to some cousin of his. He arranged everything. Sab istamal kiya, sab tayar kiya mare liye. He gave us a car ride around the whole. We saw things that we had never only heard of, but never seen. But then he packed us off to some cousin of his. And I said, what was that guy's name? No, gen today's generation won't know. Trilochan Kapoor. He said, I don't know what he was to Prithiviraj. He was his own brother. And he was a bigger star than Prithiviraj Kapoor in the 40s. The highest grossing film of 1950 was, was Trilochan Kapoor's. So that's just the trivia for a film <laughs> fanatic. <clears throat> and the connection with the book. Second is, I think you need a lot. So one of the problems now is the, the books and the textbooks and the discussion and what a book says may not be what the book actually says. It's what the book is quoted as in the WhatsApp edition of the book. <laughs> right? The WhatsApp university. So the thing is actually, you know, I know it's very difficult for many people, but I always tell my students, and I've been teaching journalism for 37 years, first thing, read. It hasn't killed anybody yet. <laughs> I know you don't want to be the first, you know, but uh, the, the evidence is that it doesn't kill you. And if you read more and learn to understand what how you verify the authenticity of a source, right? If you find someone quoting something and they give you a hyperlink, if they don't give you a hyperlink, be suspicious. Hmm. If they give you a hyperlink, follow it up, verify. I as a journalist say, the first thing in journalism, journalism is a discipline of verification. That's at least my history background speaking. Yeah, so that's, yeah. The other thing is to engage in the debates over this. To engage in this debate. Hmm. There are some people who you're never going to change. 
Yeah. There were people who, decades later, believe that things were better in those days, in the British Raj, etc., etc., all that, that sort of stuff. But you can, you know, first is the question of educating ourselves. For me, that meant sacrifices like reading the life of Barrister Savarkar. <laughs> okay? So, uh, yeah. So it, it meant things like that. It, the second thing is, what you read, how you <coughs> ingest it, how you, you know, Don Quixote, you know, the, Michael Ch uh, Miguel Cervantes, Cervantes' major character. Cervantes is reputed to have said of his own character, Don Quixote. And it's a saying I keep in my notice board. Reading everything he came across made Don Quixote a great man. Believing everything he read made him mad. <laughs> okay, so you, you, look, you look at that. The other thing is, you really have to act as in public action against your, the a media that not only lies, but knows it is lying. Not only carries lies of others, but will not question or challenge it. You have to do that. There are other forums offering. Okay, uh, actually, I'm, one of the suggestions I have to make to you is from a Dilbert cartoon. You know, I I've been hesitating to make it, but I'll tell you the cartoon. The Iran era, the invasion of Iraq is on, and Dogbert is conducting the is anchoring a TV show. And it's a deadly comment on bogus TV panel discussions. But it serves my purpose here. So, Dogbert says, today our discussion is on, everywhere in the world, people want to kill us Americans. Why do they want to kill us Americans? We tried asking them, but they don't have phones. <laughs> and then, they, so, the next best thing we can do is to have to ex the top experts in the field. General so-and-so and professor so-and-so. General so-and-so, why are they trying to kill us Americans? They're trying to kill us because they're jealous of our American values, our democracy, our might, our power, our vision. Professor so-and-so, why are they trying to kill us Americans? Professor so-and-so says, buy my book or you will all die. Can I say, buy my book and read it? <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, I think that's a wonderful place to stop. Um, and Mr. Sainath, can I just say thank you for a talk that, dis that disturbed, educated, and inspired in equal measure, which I think is the mark of a great talk. Thank you very much. And you've held us spellbound long after BIC gave us time. I wanted to say thank you to BIC for co-hosting generously this wonderful talk. And I was going to ask uh, Mr. Narayan, that's youngest brother, Mr. Mukunda, to come and give you a little token of his thanks. And with that, I wanted to end this uh, session. Thank you so much.